It's a very large room. And just as when I was in law school in this room, we always sat at the back. Well, not that I was in this room. Elizabeth will point out, I think this is all new. I came to law school before the fire. Everything at Dalhousie Law School was defined by before the fire and after the fire. And uh, this was all constructed after the fire. Now, I think uh, some of the people in the room are in uh, the cannabis module that we start after Hugo's talk. No? Some of you are. Good, great. Because you're all supposed to be here. And uh, my name is Anne McClellan. I'm Chancellor of Dalhousie University, but I am also in the public policy group at the law firm of Bennett Jones. And my colleague, Daryl Dexter, who uh, is uh, co-chairing, I guess, this uh, intensive module in cannabis and the law. And many of you probably know Chelsea, and Chelsea actually is the brains behind the whole operation and has been working with Daryl and me and putting together the uh, uh, course outline and the materials. So thank you very much, Chelsea, for that. Uh, and today we're really lucky because we uh, have, uh, kicking this intensive module off, uh, someone who has been in the cannabis business uh, longer than almost, the legal cannabis business. There have been a lot of people in this country in the illegal side much longer than Hugo. But on the legal side of the cannabis business, Hugo Wells is one, uh, well, pro absolutely one of the very earliest uh, people to uh, see both the potential, and this started with medicinal, of course, but uh, to see the potential of, of this industry, but also to see where lawyers fit and the opportunities for lawyers in this space and for law firms. And I first uh, got to know Hugo because we were both at the law firm at Bennett Jones. And in fact, uh, Hugo was a senior corporate commercial partner at Bennett Jones before uh, he decided to leave with three other of our very talented lawyers at Bennett Jones. And off they went into the private sector after legalization. And Hugo first went as president and CEO of Cannabis Sweden. But Cannabis Wheaton very quickly morphed into Oxley, and where, in fact, uh, Hugo is the co-founder and CEO of Oxley. And uh, some of you uh, know probably uh, something about that company. Uh, and in fact, I guess it's fair to say, well, you're probably going to talk about this, but you started primarily in financing, but now you're working through the whole value chain. And you will talk to people here a little bit about how all that happened. Uh, Hugo uh, actually, I've got to say, played a key role in the development of this industry in so many ways. When I was asked by the Government of Canada to chair the task force on the legalization of cannabis, the first thing we had to do with the law firm was in fact uh, make sure that if I took on this job as task force chair, I was not interfering with actually <laughs> the fee paying clients that Hugo represented in the law firm. Government of Canada expects me to do everything pro bono. But uh, Hugo actually had fee paid clients, and we, in big law firms, obviously, you have to be very careful about conflicts and that kind of thing. So Hugo was tremendous in that we figured out a way that uh, everybody could continue to do the things they were doing, and I could take up the role as chair of the task force. So I'm not sure I've ever thanked you for that, but now I'm thanking you, Hugo. Thank you, because uh, without um, his openness and actually I, I hope seeing the prospect that somehow it was good for your clients uh, uh, that uh, in fact this legalization project moved ahead and moved ahead in a way that was informed by uh, we hope reasonable and sensible recommendations. Hugo's represented so many of the big companies in this space, Tweed, Canopy, Aurora, Supreme, uh, Lift and Company, the brands, Tokyo Smoke. One of those is opening just down the street from Bennett Jones and Edmonton. After Leaf, uh, Leafs by Snoop and then industry associations, the Cannabis Council of Canada, uh, patient access groups, Canadians for fair access to medical marijuana, Cannabis Rx, Canadian Cannabis Clinics. He's also the co-founder of Hope for Health, 
and that's the world's first registered charity focused on providing access to medical and medical cannabis and the advancement of knowledge relating to medical cannabis. And of course, Canada, first mover advantage on the medicinal side, I was Federal Minister of Health in 2001 when we started the medicinal stream. And, and Hugo is going to tell you a little bit about that was his first involvement in this whole space. But he is one of the people now, one of the most imaginative and creative innovators in this space, leading the way in terms of what this is going to look like for the future. So. Uh, Unfortunately, Hugo did not go to Dow Law School. He went to Western. No. No. Oh, We're going to U of T even worse. Don't hold even it against me. You took my joke. Don't oh, hold sorry. it against me. I, I, I didn't go to U of T. Even worse, he went to U of T. Anyway, I, you. Uh, okay. I <laughs> no, I don't. We're very I promise. We had fun there too. We don't like U of T. We don't like Queens, and you're a Dow Law. Anyway, all that to say. U of T is a very good law school, and Hugo is a graduate of U of T, and he got his undergraduate degree at Carleton University in Ottawa. So all that to say that we're really lucky to have Hugo with us today, because he truly deserves the word pioneer in the cannabis space. Over to you, Hugo. Thanks so much, Ann. Right here? Good. Well, it's hard to, it's always, I've, I've had the pleasure of speaking um, with Anne on panels or following Anne, and it's, it's never an easy task. So uh, my name's Hugo Alves. I'm, you know, I'm here. I was a lawyer on Bay Street for 17 years, and most of that time at Bennett Jones in, in, in Toronto, and that is where I met Anne. Um, very fortunate to have Anne as uh, my colleague, and I think, you know, as much as she likes to say, hey, you know, really needed to work with Hugo to figure out uh, whether I could uh, co-chair the task force. The, the, the honest truth of it is um, myself and the other people who really ran that business at, at Bennett Jones um, did everything we could to encourage Anne to take on the, the role uh, very naively on our part, like we thought it'd be great. Anne's uh, going to chair this task force. We're going to have the inside scoop on everything. <laughs> and what it actually turned into was, don't talk to Anne. Don't email Anne. None of your clients can talk or email Anne. You're getting zero access to her while the task force is ongoing. And we knew the importance of Anne's work on that task force, so we were happy to comply in the strictest way possible. In fact, I think during that entire time, I had one communication with Anne, which was uh, through our colleague, Eddie Goldenberg, where um, I had said, hey, Eddie, there's other people, other lawyers that are getting invited to these industry task force roundtables. I'm looking like a bit of, you know, like kind of like a second fiddle here. I'm not getting an invite. And I remember Eddie came into uh, my office and, you know, Eddie is, uh, <coughs> You know, he, he's a, a, a fantastic person, not super tall, you know, and he's not super tall. So or I was sitting in my chair and like we're looking eye to eye and, uh, and he looks at me and goes, you really don't understand uh, much of how the world works here, do you? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, look, you know, you're getting no access to Anne and, and but after the task force report is submitted, that's when you get all the benefit because you have access to Anne, you can bring your clients to meet her and uh, Anne was very gracious with her time uh, afterwards to help me sort of um, get my clients exposure to Anne and what the task force uh, really meant for the future. And I, I, I'm happy to say that on the one year anniversary of, of legalization that just passed, uh, I think the task force did an incredible job. And I think, Anne, I conveyed that to you when the, the report came out and I first read it. And I think the federal government has done a great job in terms of supporting the recommendations that the task force made because I remember when the task, when the report came out, and we'll talk a little bit later on in the presentation about how my legal background has kind of influenced the path that Oxley's taken from you know inception to where we are today. Um, but I remember looking at that task force report, which we used quite almost like a roadmap in terms of where regulation could go forward, and thinking, I don't know if we're going to get this. This seems like quite a you know an advanced position, one that maybe from a policy or a political perspective might be a step too far. But uh, in fact, we were pleasantly surprised when the government implemented almost all of the recommendations. So 
I'm very fortunate to have Anne as a colleague. She's been tremendous help in my career, and I thank her and thank you guys for having me here today. Um, so as Anne said, I didn't go to Dow. I went to U of T, but you know, please don't hold that uh, against me. Um, since 2017, I have been at Oxley, which is a, uh, a public cannabis company that I co-founded with my then client, uh, Chuck Rafici, who was the founder of Tweed that went on to become Canopy. Uh, so Chuck was actually supposed to be the person talking to you today. Um, and when Ann said, hey, Chuck, Chuck couldn't make it. He sends his regrets, by the way. Can you step in? I said, well, it's, it's Chuck the backed out and it's Ann asking me. So I 100% would be delighted to stand in and um, you know, I'm happy, happy to be here. So Ann told me I was free to ramble on for whatever I wanted to talk about. Um, so what I thought might be of interest to you is I'm just going to give you a brief overview of how I got into cannabis law and then a couple of lessons that I learned along the way that might you know, benefit you and then how my legal background has really helped shape Oxley. And then I'll just open up the floor and you, know, you guys can feel free to ask about whatever you want from regulatory to the business of law to the business of cannabis. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, so I think the first thing is really, I became a lawyer right at the genesis of the really formative cannabis law in the country. Um, so I, I'm a 99 grad, and then in 2000 you had R.V. Parker, which really said, hey, you know, that was that constitutional section seven argument about, oh, I should say, even though Chuck's not here, I can assure you I know more about the law than Chuck does, so you at least get that benefit. Uh, uh, so, you know, that was a Section 7 case that really said if it, you're, you, there's this conflicting priority of, you know, freedom of the person and, you know, freedom of your liberty and having to go out and break the law to access cannabis if you've been prescribed it was really un not constitutionally valid. So created a mandate for the government to then pass regulation of how cannabis access would be passed. So 2000, I'm a bright bushy-tailed articling student at that point at Heenan Blakey. Uh, 2001, the government introduces the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations, the MMAR. I'm a first year associate now, so I'm like pretty hot at this point in time, right? Uh, I also grew up in the east end of Hamilton, which is instru usually where you grow up, not that instructive. Here it, it is informative. I don't know if any of you know where Hamilton, Ontario is, but it, it is the, the steel town. In the East End, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very blue collar, working class uh, part of the city. And so growing up, cannabis was something that was around us. And what happened when the MMR, MMAR came into, uh, came into force, and I'm a first year associate at a law firm, started getting a lot of calls from high school friends going, hey man, pot's legal. Uh, I need you to help me fill in this form so I can get my license and we can start growing legally. So, uh, all right, sounds cool. Um, so it started this, I would say, six month period where I had like my legal job and then I was helping my high school friends fill out 16 page forms uh, after they'd gone to get their diagnosis and then the confirmation of diagnosis. Uh, and I quickly realized, yeah, like this is not what I went to school for. Uh, you know, filling out uh, forms for your buddies, like that's, that don't pay you fees. You know, something told me that wasn't really what I, uh, what I just spent uh, seven years getting a, a law degree, you know, for. So I said, hey guys, like, you know, this is great. You know, I helped my friends. And then I went about doing Bay Street Law and paying my dues and, uh, grinding hours and uh, doing all those good things, learning. And uh, it was fantastic. I, I loved my time doing that. It was like looking back on it, it's super hard work, but it's exciting. You're actually putting into practice what you learned about theoretically in school. You are working with tremendous people. I think that's one of the things that I, I was just telling Ann, I've had to adjust leaving law and going into private practice is just the uniform, uniformly high caliber of person that you deal with at a law firm in terms from a, a work ethic perspective, from a, an intellectual perspective, from a motivational perspective. Um, it really was something that you take for granted and once you leave, you, you kind of realize, so you, you know, that really was a, a special work environment. Um, so 
went about becoming a lawyer, became a partner in uh, 2007. Along the way, I had some tremendous mentors. One in particular, which again, I think is in informative to the story, was a gentleman named Gray Taylor, who was a 30-year partner at Davies Ward in Beck. You know, uh, the sort of like the hotshot boutique client uh, for a transactional practice perspective in Canada. And Gray had come to Bennett Jones very late in his career. Uh, almost at retirement age. And I thought, well, you know, here's another old guy that, you know, is coming to our firm that's just kind of here to see out the rest of his career. But that actually is not why he came at all. He came to our firm because he, at that point in time, uh, in, in sort of the early 2000s, there was something going on called the Kyoto Protocol. And Gray is a passionate um, advocate for sustainability and for you know combating climate change and he wanted to build a practice around climate change you know at this point Canada was a signatory uh, was going to have the second largest compliance obligation in the world second only to the EU um, and he wanted to build a practice around it and I think what what Davies had told him was you know what, that's not the type of work we do here. We just do transactions, so we're not really supportive of that. So he came to Bennett Jones and um, enlisted me to help him very early on in that practice. And I got to watch him take a regulatory change and build a business around it. And I had lots of good lessons, less, some things like lessons that I thought, well, this really worked. And some things I thought, ah, this didn't work so well, but they were lessons all the same. And things like having to figure out what two parties were trying to do from a commercial perspective, like what's the deal here, and then figure out how to bring legal structure around it where there are no precedents. There's no instructive document that they can say, here, this is what you got to go through and just figure out if your deal fits into these provisions and you know, if A, then B. It wasn't commoditized law. It was like you really have to think about what you're trying to do, what the underlying regulatory regime is, and then you freehand draft. Um, and that, I think, more than anything else that happened to me throughout my entire legal career was what enabled me to really build a, a, a strong cannabis practice. Um, so fast forward, 2013, I'm at my desk and I get uh, the Canada Gazette and I'm not going to lie, for probably 99.9% .9 of my time up until that point that I got the Canada Gazette, when you're in an environment where you're routinely getting 100, 200 plus actionable emails a day, that's an easy delete. I don't, you know what, I'll deal with the law when it's actually law. I don't have to, to deal with it. But here, the headline had marijuana. It had marijuana, but spelled in a funny way, an H. And I'm like, well, this, I got to check this out. So I, I read the, you know, abstract and I started reading the regulations. And what I quickly just to kind of clued into me was, wait a minute, the government is changing the focus of regulation from a person, right? The MMAR regulated the person, it regulated the patient. You know, you the patient, do you have a... Do you have an ailment that falls within this list? Do you have a second opinion that says you have that ailment? Fill out this form, tell me how much cannabis you need and we'll process it as the government. So they changed that focus away from the person to production and distribution. So they weren't regulating people anymore, they were regulating corporations. And of course, whenever you regulate a corporation, as lawyers, we're like, well, corporations need legal services and they can afford to pay. So fantastic clients. So it started to get me thinking about, look, I, I've, my entire life I've been, you know, people ask me, well, why'd you get into cannabis? And, you know, there's the, the PC answer that I give, which is, well, you know, I'd noticed a regulatory change and I decided I wanted to build a business around cannabis. And then there's like the real reason, like I was a cannabis uh, enthusiast or, you know, cannabis has played a role in my life growing up from an early age till, till present. Um, and I thought, you know what, it'd be way cooler uh, doing work for cannabis companies I probably, and, you know, building a business around cannabis than what I was doing at the time, which was still, I really enjoyed, right? I was one of the three partners that ran the technology, media, and entertainment group at our firm, which is not a bad gig. But uh, I thought this is a chance to own something. And, you know, that was one of the lessons that I learned. Like, if you go into a big firm environment, like, your power lies in what you own. If you own a book of business, it's your book. 
You know, they're your clients. You get a lot of uh, latitude. You get a lot of resources available to you. You know, they, they used to have, at least when I was in law school, they'd ask you, like, are you a finder, a minder, or a grinder? Like, and then I started practicing, and I realized, like, you've got to be all three uh, to really be successful. But it's only really if you, you had that book of business that you felt that sort of stability of, you know, running a business that you kind of controlled. So I thought this would be a great thing to try and do. And then uh, we got a little bit lucky in that one of my mentees, Michael Lickfer, who's you know, now he's effectively our, our chief of staff at Oxley, um, had done some pro bono work for a guy who was around his age. And you know, whenever you do some pro bono work, it's on your time. So that what you hope the person you're doing the, the work for, what they do is they reciprocate at some point. You know, and they say, hey, when I can afford to pay, I will come back and you'll be my lawyer, etc." And this person actually did that. So they came back in and they said, I'm, I'm trying to start this marijuana company. You know, we've put an application in. We're running into some difficulties. Can you help me? And we can pay. We've got some financing. Um, so that client turned out to be Believe, uh, which is a licensed producer now. And I think at that time, I was in Michael's office and I said to him, I said, why don't we just go after this? There's no one out there, because there literally was no one out there. I think there was one other lawyer uh, that was openly practicing in cannabis that was in Ottawa, Trina, Trina Fraser. And so I said, like, we're experts. He goes, we're not really experts. I go, why not? Like, who, who knows more than we do about what's going on in these regs right now? And he kind of said, well, I don't know. That's right, that's right, no one. No one, because guarantee you we know more about these regs right now than your client does. And uh, let's just get smart. Like we're, we're smart people, we're hard workers. Let's just get smart and let's go after it. And you know what? Like that's what we did. We took a risk. Um, I was at Bennett Jones is, you know, Calgary Energy, uh, I think, you know, and, and I'm not a, a, like a, a huge political person, but I think you would call it a small C conservative yes. firm. Yes. So I knew that if I went and said, hey, Hugh, I'm thinking of, Hugh was our managing partner and, uh, you know, really entrepreneurial supportive guy. So, yeah. um, but I knew if I went and asked the question, I want to build a practice around cannabis, probably it's going to be, yeah, you really want to do that. You know, there's risk. So we didn't ask. We just did it. Um, and we marketed and networked aggressively. We really put ourselves out there. Um, and, you gotta, and we owned it. You know, yeah, we know the regs better than anyone else. Well, if you put that statement out there, you better own it. Um, and you, you know, Michael is a, Mike is a lot more of a social person than I am. I'm much more of an introvert. So having to go out and network and build a network you know, and work for that network didn't come naturally to me. But, you know, we took the risk and we said, if we're taking the risk with our career, this thing that we've worked so hard to, to, to build, especially at my point in my career at that time where I, you know, I, I was a partner at, at a firm, a senior partner, um, then it, we, we need to put 100% effort into it. And it really, what that led to is us working two full-time jobs. So um, I worked my normal shift where I was doing uh, technology, media, and entertainment law uh, to, to, to discharge my obligations to the firm as a partner to make sure that you know, the, the sort of financial obligations that I had to the firm that I was taking care of them. And Mike, Mike was doing the same thing. And then when everyone else went home around you know, six or seven, not, not that that's a normal shift at, at the law firm, it usually goes much later, but when things quieted down, we would turn our attention to, all right, now we've got to build our cannabis practice, whether that was, you know, networking with people every day, whether that was doing thought pieces, acting pro bono, starting industry associations and helping them. Our goal was really to build a network and to get a reputation within that network um, as smart, connected guys that you wanted to talk to. So slowly and surely we started to get traction. We built, and that's the reputation we built. We built a reputation as really smart guys who knew the regulations in and out, but above that, 
super connected guys who knew everyone in the industry um, and who was, were always willing to help people. So whether or not someone came into our office, we never said no to anyone in terms of, hey, we're in town, we, we'd like to meet you for a half hour, we always said yes. Uh, we, we, we never judge a book by, by its cover. Someone comes into our fancy Bay Street offices, they're not looking a certain way, we didn't care. You know, we, we would talk to absolutely everyone, and if we could help with a connection, with a, some advice, we would help. You can't act pro bono for everybody because then you don't have time to discharge your financial obligations to your firm. But um, where we could help and where we saw opportunity, we had no hesitation. Uh, in the firm, after a while, you know, everyone found out, um, and uh, they were very hugely supportive. Hugely supportive, um, and I think part of that was we had been very responsible in terms of how we approached things. Like we weren't putting the firm's logo all over, you know, pot websites and things like that. Um, so, you know, for us, taking a thought leadership position was really helpful, but thought leadership that's client focused, not peer focused. You know, a lot of the papers that get published by practicing lawyers are about a novel legal issue, and they're more for the bar. They're more for their colleagues to go, that guy's really smart. We didn't care about that. You know, we wanted potential clients to think we were smart. So, you know, we would write thought pieces on like, uh, if you're applying for an, uh, a license, four quick takeaways, you know, four pitfalls you have to avoid. And then we would, we would go and bug our employment colleague and say, hey, like, you know, what are like four things that you should think about? And then we would write the paper for them and send it to them and no more, and never more than two pages was the absolute max. We wanted people to read these things. Um, and they, they started saying, oh, that's cool. You're, you're kind of work, trying to build a business here. Um, and so they would give us some of their time. And, you know, then cannabis became a thing, right? Then it went from being this kind of program that the conservative government had put in but wasn't really promoting to public companies and financings. And then Trudeau got elected and legalization. And all of a sudden there was a ton of money. Everyone could pay and everyone wanted to do deals and a real shortage of advisors that could actually do these deals. And I, I remember acting for a very small company that's now public called Canmart. Um, well, they're not public. They're acquired by Namaste, which is public. So acting for Canmart, they had a very unique business model. And they wanted to do a wholesale purchase from Supreme, which was at that time not my client. And Supreme had a client out, a uh, lawyer in Calgary that had helped put their going public transaction together. And this supply agreement, so Supreme supplying Canmart with flour, was an iron ore supply agreement with the words iron ore crossed out and cannabis put in. Like, that, well, that's literally, I'd seen the precedent before. And we said, okay, great, we'll start here. And now here's 10 reasons why this doesn't work and let us fix it up. And we, like, you know, we, we got the deal done, we redrafted the contract, and this is where that skill set that I learned with Gray of what's the underlying regulatory regime, what am I trying to accomplish, and then how do I put those two together in a way that benefits my client's interests. And, you know, John Fowler will tell the story, he goes, yeah, so after we did that deal, we realized how horrible this contract was for Supreme and how favorable it was for Canmart, and we said, well, we need Hugo to act for us. And that's, you know, so that's how Supreme came to be our client. Um, and so by 2017, we, our cannabis practice was the fastest growing practice at Bennett Jones. It was one of the, the largest practices at Bennett Jones in terms of dollars originated. Um, and we, you know, we were by far the dominant cannabis group globally. Like if you were, interested in cannabis, participating in the cannabis industry, anywhere in the world, and you came through Toronto, you guaranteed you went through the Bennett Jones office. Um, and at one point or another, we had acted for 70% of all market participants in the Canadian cannabis industry. Um, and then in 2017, um, again, with now everyone has money, everyone wants to, you know, is dreaming big. We started getting a lot of opportunities to say if we would be interested in leaving the firm and joining you know, the private sector. 
And I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit, I would say, since I was uh, uh, a, young, a young kid. And I think you know, that manifested itself in how we built the cannabis practice at the firm. And I'd always thought, well, that would be something fun to try, but I really liked being a lawyer. Like, I really liked it, and I had now achieved kind of what, when people go into law, they're hoping to achieve. You know, I had a big book of business that I owned, um, and I had recognition, respect, rewards. You know, the law firms treat you very well when you're, you're, uh, you're bringing in a lot more money than they're paying you, so you, you get treated really well. So it was a big risk. And I thought, well, I already took a huge risk with my career when in 2013 where I said, I want to focus a big amount of attention on cannabis. And the result is I probably know the law around cannabis better than I've known any other sort of underlying regulatory regime. I have more profile in the cannabis industry than I've ever had in any type of industry. Um, so I thought if I'm not willing to take the risk and, and do it now, it's sort of hard to contemplate the circumstances under which you would take the risk. So I, I didn't want to live with the regret. And so I said, sure, I, I'll join Chuck here at uh, what was then called Cannabis Wheaton. Um, because uh, you know, I believed in what we were doing. I had a hand in putting it together. This was a client-driven initiative that then turned into us assuming uh, sort of control of this company um, through like our client sold their business to the, the public company that would eventually go on to be Cannabis Wheaton. Um, and I, I have to say, I haven't regretted it uh, a day since I left. Um, I certainly miss the law firm. I miss my colleagues there. I miss you know, the resources, the work environment, the level at which everyone operates. But uh, as Anne said, my three closest juniors came with me to, uh, to Oxley. Um, and it's been an incredible learning experience, right? It's, uh, you really have to get up a curve very quickly when you go into a company that's under the public eye, where you've got investor money, and you know it's very easy to see how you're doing every day. I mean, we don't look at it that way. We don't look at our share price as a proxy to how we're doing, but it's there. It's there, and you got to deal with it. And I know some days I get home, and you know my personal CFO, my my wife will say like, what the hell happened to you guys today? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. We had a great day. She's like, you're, you know, the share price didn't do great today. I'm like, oh, we're, not, we're not focused on that. We're focused on the business part. Um, the lessons I learned along the way in sort of my journey from being a lawyer to building a, a practice at the firm and then uh, joining, joining uh, the private practice uh, at, on, the, on the industry side was, you know, be entrepreneurial. You guys are heading into a much different environment than I had, you know, was exposed to when I was starting my legal career. Um, clients are more demanding. They're more cost conscious. Value is what they want to buy, not a service. Um, and there's huge amount of competition. You really, you know, your career is your business. It's your personal business and you have to treat it like that. It's not a job, what you're going into. You know, then there's no job security. You get into it what you, you get out what you put in. And so I think owning something is important and being, putting yourself out there in terms of saying, hey, I am going to own this. And if it fails or succeeds, I'm willing to, to wear that. And of course, what that forces you to do is if you're going to take a risk, you know, there's an old adage, you know, if it's worth the risk, it's worth the effort. And that's very true when you're dealing with your career. I mean, you're making a tremendous investment in your education by being at law school. It's a huge amount of time and effort. Um, and when you get into legal practice, it'll be, you just keep stepping up. You know, I remember being an articling student and uh, I was working 100 hours a week and the, manage, the partner who was giving me the work said, enjoy it, it's only gonna get, it just gets harder from here on in. I'm like, not what I wanted to hear at that particular point in time, but it was very true. You know, being an associate was harder than being an articling student. Being a partner was way harder than being an associate. Um, so, you know, you need, if you're willing to take a risk with that, with that level of effort, then you need to work super hard. Taking a risk and just hoping it works out never works out. So, you know, uh, Gray used to say to me, you know, Hugo, like the harder, harder you work, the luckier you get. And it was, it was very true. 
it'll look to the outside that you are just super lucky. Right? My colleagues and, and peers who didn't go through the journey with me, they would say, man, you're so lucky. Like, you know, cannabis became a thing. And it was like, yeah, super lucky, I know. Uh, and you agree with them, but you know that in the background, luck had very little to do with it. It was just a calculated risk that we then put a ton of effort and we were willing to live with whether it was successful or unsuccessful because we know that we put all the effort into it. So if it didn't work out, didn't work out, wasn't a failure. Um, network. I, like, I, you know, going back, I grew up in the East End of Hamilton. Uh, I think we had 13 students that graduated from my high school that did post-secondary degrees. So you're not starting from like a really high value network there. Um, and then you've got, to, you've got to figure out, okay, well, what is a network? Like, how do I get people that will give me work? Because at the end of the day, that, you know, that's, that's the goal. You want to you get clients to trust you enough with their work to get you to, you know, do the, the, give them legal advice, business advice, and obviously execute on the deal. So start now. You know, you start now. The people who are in your classroom, get to know them. Um, get, stay in touch with them. It's so easy nowadays with all of the different social media platforms, but building a network and then really thinking about your network. I have 16,000 connections on LinkedIn. There's, I would say like my network is probably a couple hundred people and within there is probably 50 people that you know, I could phone up and say, this is what I'm thinking of doing and they would write me a check. Right? But it's those people, like, you really have to think about them. When there's something that you think can benefit them, send it to them. You know, if you meet someone and then you meet another person, you go, these two probably have something in common. Connect them. Um, so it's, it's really building a network, thinking about your network, working hard for that network, and it will work hard for you. You know, and don't get discouraged. It doesn't happen overnight, for sure. But if you put in the effort and if you actually are true to that, I'm going to think about my network and work hard for my network, um, it will, it will you know, be reciprocated. by Your, your network will work for you. Um, and I guess the last thing is just have fun. Um, you have to love what you do. Uh, I had lots of people I went to law school with that were way smarter than me. Um, they did way better at, uh, at the academic part of, of law school than I did, um, didn't, didn't last. You know, first year, second year, third year, eighth year, um, transition to other jobs. It just didn't, like it's a, law is a demanding profession. And if you don't love what you're doing, then eventually it's gonna start to feel like work. Um, and look, there's always bad days. I, always bad days, trying days, and uh, days might be generous, right? Like it, it, back to back days. Um, but that's okay, you, you know, nothing is, even if you, you thought you had like your dream job, like you know, that you thought, dreamt about as a kid, guaranteed there are bad days there too. You gotta put one foot in front of the other. And remember, this is a journey, and so you should enjoy it. And like, even though I'm working harder now than I ever worked at the firm, you know, it's hard, it was hard for me to contemplate that when I was at the firm, um, I continue to have a ton of fun because I'm with people that I respect and that I like and you know, we, we work together and my, you know, my wife often jokes, like, you guys have too much fun at work because you, know, you guys are there all the time. Um, and there's a lot of truth to that actually. Um, so enjoy the journey and have fun. Um, so look, now I'll, I'll say a few words about how my legal background has really influenced kind of my, my business journey and influenced Oxley. And I think um, one of the things that we've always held as a thesis at Oxley is that our regulatory acumen is a competitive advantage for us. And it really drives a lot of how we see the industry, where we see it moving to, where there's opportunity, uh, what geographies we might look at next. Because when we started this, these Oxley, it was all people that had achieved a high level of success in whatever their industry was. So, you know, myself was at the law firm, Chuck was with, with Tweed, our CFO, Jeff, um, had already at the age of 28, you know, founded and sold two businesses. Uh, so very successful people that took a lot of risk to do it. And we, none of us did it with the goal of being kind of a, you know, 
a nice business. Like we all want it to be in the conversation at the, the top end of the industry. So we're always looking for ways like how can we make up ground because regulated industry started in 2014. Our, our company started in 2017, late 2017. So figuring out how we can make up ground on our, our peer group or who we consider our peer group has always been kind of a central focus for us. And what the regulatory acumens allowed us to do is, you know, allowed us to buy assets in emerging geographies where we knew kind of what the regulatory pathway was before it got too expensive. So an example of that would be, you know, we went into Uruguay really early. We bought a business there for $15 million with a really class operator. And then a year later, Aurora went into Uruguay and bought a business that was less developed than ours was for $200 million. Um, it's allowed us to get rights, commercial rights in our negotiations before the people we were negotiating with figured out that these were very valuable rights. and They probably could have done a lot better on the deal. Um, so for example, we were able to in negotiations for early on for our equity stakes in retailers to tie in shelf space rights. Like we want the top shelves, we want branding rights. Um, and they were happy to say, yeah, whatever, because you know, back then the industry thought, or you know, in our view was deluding itself into thinking that the marketing and advertising prohibitions which apply, were going to apply to cannabis would be the same as alcohol and they made industry groups to work with ad standards to say we can really police ourselves. But you know, as advisors and people who had dealt a lot with the sort of the patient side of it and the, the sort of medical practitioner side, we knew that, and maybe I'm putting it too strongly here, Anne, but we knew that, that doctors and healthcare professionals really viewed the alcohol marketing as like a public health failure. So there's no way we're going there, right? And like we knew that also as, as regulatory experts, we knew in terms of kind of sin product marketing and advertising spectrum, you had alcohol, hugely permissive, narcotics, which is where cannabis was at, at the time under the old MMPR, um, which is restrictive. And then you have tobacco, which is prohibitive. And we thought if we're lucky, we might get narcotics, might stay the same, but likely it's going to go tobacco. You know, this is just such a big public policy shift for the government. They're going to want to take it, you know, be careful. They're not, one of the underlying objectives is, you know, keeping it out of the hands of young people. Advertising is very often targeted at like newer consumers. So we knew very unlikely that we're going to have an open advertising regime. And of course, that means that those few places under the Tobacco Act, because that's what we were looking at at the time, not the Cannabis Act, it wasn't in existence. Um, under the Tobacco Act, we were like, well, we kind of see the exemptions there. One of them is in store at a tobacconist. So we think on these retail locations, there'll be a similar exemption. So we negotiated for those rights before the retailer knew that, hey, these are actually super, super valuable rights. We can get a lot of money for them. Um, and it's also helped us, I think, fundamentally develop our forward-looking strategy because when we started this business, it wasn't Oxley, um, it was a company called Cannabis Wheaton, which was really, we had taken a financing model from the precious metals industry where you give people a bunch of money up front so they can build out their mine and then you take a stream, basically all of the silver produced in the mine at a set price which is well below the price and then you sell the silver, make the delta, and you, you know, make a profit. Um, so we thought we were going to be really clever and do that in the cannabis industry. And it was useful because investors thought it was really clever too and gave us a bunch of money. Then what happened is we got to actually having to write the checks to the people that we'd said, if you pass due diligence, we'll, we'll finance your project. And what we found is... Unlike the mining industry where you have geological reports that tell you, you know, the ore is in the ground and you have uh, sophisticated operators, um, cannabis is brand new. And the operators in the space at that time were early movers, which by definition, high risk, high reward, right? So these are, sorry, these are, are people who, you know, are visionary in a lot of ways, but in terms of that super detail oriented focus. We didn't have a lot of confidence. And then we started seeing a lot of due diligence problems with a lot of the projects. 
right? So people would come and say, we have a dream. It's like, here's our plot of land and we've built, we're going to build this like 10,000 square foot uh, facility here. But then Oxley with your help or Cannabis Wheat with your help, we're going to build 100,000 square feet and then we're going to do the whole thing and it's going to be an amazing project. And we'd say, sounds great. Let's have a look. And then part of the diligence that we would ask is, show me the analysis for the base load energy requirement to run just this 10,000 square foot and then the 100,000 and then show me a feasibility study that says there's enough power to the parcel of land to light that up because you know cannabis production is quite energy intensive and you just hear kind of crickets you know or they would point to power lines going through the land saying hey, all the power i need right there don't worry about it and of course, when investors have given you a lot of money and you've got to write the checks, it's your job to worry about it. So we quickly said, you know, this isn't going to work. And we were just failing people on due diligence, um, you know, out of 15 projects. I think we failed like 13 that we went to market with. So we said, you know what, we need to take a step back and sort of do what we think we do best, which is let's look at the regulatory landscape and let's try and think about now that we have a better understanding of like how much time is actually going to elapse before we have a, a product to sell, let's think of maybe there's a smarter way to do this. So we turned to the regs, we turned to the task force report, we took to you know, what the WHO was saying, what other geographies were saying, and what we found was this very persistent regulatory dialogue around cannabis consumers or cannabis patients having the right to consume cannabis in forms other than dried flour or cannabis oil. And so we thought, well, we kind of know what the task force says on edibles and extracts, and we kind of know what our timeline for our projects to come online and actually provide us with cannabis looks like. We can have a conversation today, this, and this is to give you some timeline, this was kind of spring like this was uh, early 2018, early spring of 2018. We kind of know, we kind of know where we're going to be kind of a year from now, two years from now. We kind of know what the government's timeline is. We can have a conversation today about who the best dried flower grower is or who sells the most cannabis, right? It's not going to be us. And for us to get there, it's going to be very hard. But we can't have a conversation in Canada about who sells the most edibles, who sells the most topicals, or who sells the most vape pens. So we thought, you know, what if the government actually, you know, does us a huge service here and creates this sort of second starting line? And so we started telling investors, you know, when we, we're, we're going to focus on cannabis 2.0, and now that's very common terminology. But for us, what 2.0 meant is not it's really a second starting line where you know, we can have a horse at the gate at the same time as our peer group. And other people might show up with you know, bigger horses, but we're going to be there. We're going to be in the conversation. So what we started doing is quickly changing, you know, acquiring the assets and the expertise that we needed to position ourselves. So we made this shift in kind of April of uh, 2018, uh, May of 2018, we acquired DoseCan, our big processing and manufacturing facility in PEI. And we acquired it because we knew, I think you know, this was a client had paid us a lot of money to become experts on what a license dealer license gave you in terms of your regulatory flexibility and the activities you can conduct. The rest of the market had not caught up to this sort of understanding. And so we went after DoseCan and we were able to get it for uh, I think it was $38 million, which at the time people said, you know, that's a lot of money. But we also knew kind of what was coming online, what the value of these licenses were. And our thesis was if we don't get this now, we're going to get priced out of the market really quick. So we got DoseCan. And then we started saying, well, if you're going to really develop products, cannabis products, you need a strong science team and a strong manufacturing team. So we went out and we started acquiring the scientific people that we needed to make sure that we were developing products in the, in the right way, the way a consumer packaged goods company would. Um, so we acquired some really top level people, including 
employee number six at GW Pharmaceuticals that led their ep Epidolex uh, product development pathway. Uh, Dr. Bob Chapman, who is principal scientist at the NRC in charge of cannabis and nutritional oils. Um, and Peter Crooks, who was the CEO of Canada's Smartest Kitchen, the founder and CEO of Canada's Smartest Kitchen, one of Canada's top food scientists. He'd taken 1,500 products to market in five years. And so we got that expertise and we asked them, okay, here's our vision. We want to focus on branded derivative products. What else do we need? So we got this dose can facility. So we're going to make it beautiful. We're going to sink a lot of money into the, building it out. We've got an amazing team that we're going to empower to build teams underneath themselves to make sure that we're developing the best products and uh, that we're creating the best brands. What else do you need? And they quickly said, well, look, if, if you're really serious about developing like a wellness brand and eventually, you know, we have, we have a plan to transition to what we call 3.0, but for another day. If you're, really, if you're really serious about that, then what you need is you need, some, you need more clinical support. You need a deeper clinical bench because otherwise you're you know, getting access to throughput at a contract research organization to do the sort of substantiation work um, and to give you the credibility with regulators if you're really going after these kind of natural health products or what the regulators now call cannabis health products then you need, so you need like that, that'll be a big tool for you. So we went out and two months later, we identified KGK Science, which was Canada's oldest contract research organization focused exclusively on nutraceuticals and natural health products. Um, and we acquired them to sort of bring that clinical bench strength to DoseCan. And so the idea is we have our scientists at DoseCan who formulate a product. Um, and that's a very involved process with, you know, validated methodologies, etc. And then we push it over to KGK Science that does clinical work to test safety and efficacy and quality. So, you know, if you buy a topical and it's got the dose can logo on it, you're going to know that there's been pharmacokinetic studies done to actually measure kind of what's the absorption rate of the cannabis through the dermis and kind of how much do you absorb? What is the actual bioavailability of the product? So we, we, we transitioned really quickly and it was all because of the fact that we were regulatory experts. We were able to take very informed guesses on where the regulation was likely to go and understand kind of how to leverage that knowledge into an advantage relative to our peers by getting in earlier, getting assets at the cheaper cost, and, and again, getting valuable commercial rights. And, and so at Oxley, we have our legal team is five people in-house, but in terms of how many lawyers we have working uh, at the firm, it is uh, 10 in total, all in senior positions, right? So ranging from myself as, as CEO, all the way down to kind of a regulatory associate, but our head of IR is a former lawyer. Um, our head of product strategy is a, a, is a former lawyer. And people often think that it's just because I'm a former lawyer that, you know, I kind of have a predisposition to lawyers. And it's actually, I, I, I admit, I do have some bias. I think, you know, they're, like I said before, I think if you can get through law school and you can survive at a law firm, it really says something in terms about, you know, the level that you operate at as a professional. But the reason why I think a legal background is, is so tailor-made for the cannabis industry, especially right now, is first and foremost, it's a highly regulated industry. And by highly regulated, I mean highly regulated. So I was just at um, a Health Canada inspection in Kentville, Nova Scotia, at our Robinsons facility. And the inspectors come and they do the annual inspection. And they're there to make sure that you are following your standard operating procedures when you actually operate. And I remember they said, well, you guys wash these scissors. Of course, of course we wash the scissors because if you don't wash them, they get the resin buildup and then they don't work as well. Like what's your standard operating procedure for washing the scissors? And please show me your sanitation records for washing the scissors. And so our quality assurance guy went and pulled out and they have records that they said, I washed you know, 200 pairs of trimming shears on this day and here's how I wash them and here's the, the record. So it's highly regulated. And then it's highly dynamic. So the regulations don't stay the same. They're constantly changing. You know, we always said cannabis is a political issue. 
you know, government's not so much worried about the market, whether the consumer has everything. They're worried about policy objectives. And the, the quicker you understand the canvas of political issue and that their underlying policy objectives, it really helps, you know, it's a lens that really helps bring clarity to a lot of things that otherwise you would say, well, why would they do that? Because it's not going to be good for when I have to transport my products from A to B. Well, they did that because it, it either helps divert from the black market, keep, keep it out of the hands of young children, right? Um, so there is, there is that sort of dynamic aspect to it, which means that having regulatory acumen allows you to, to, to sort of shift quicker. Right? You can see where the change is, you understand how that ties into the rest of the regulations and then therefore how that's going to impact the way you've structured your organization and the way you need to change it. Um, there are no precedents, zero. So in terms of how people are interacting with each other, uh, it will slowly change. You know, in cannabis we've adopted a lot of the sort of nomenclature almost from the oil industry. You know, you're upstream, you're midstream, you're downstream, etc. Um, there are really no precedents in terms of uh, how transactions get structured. And what that means is, you know, you really become, having that regulatory acumen allows you to use your knowledge of the regulations both as a shield and as a sword. Right? You can make concessions and contractual negotiations that really don't matter because the regulations provide you with that shield. And likewise, as the example I gave in terms of negotiating branding rights in store is, you know, you know what's going to have value and what doesn't where the opportunity is and you can actually negotiate for those things against a counterparty that maybe doesn't have as good a knowledge of, of the value there. And then everything's new. So because everything's new, you know, analysis, your, your, your ability to look at something analytically and problem solve, which is, I think, anyone that's in law school is, has that ability at, and operates at a high level, just writing the LSAT to get in here, like, you know, uh, sort of makes you flex those muscles. So I find people that have a legal background in the cannabis industry are really good at solving problems and then working on the solution, right? They're not working, looking for an easy solution and they're not going to give up if this, you know, the solution isn't readily apparent. Like you find a way to work within the regulations um, but accomplish the commercial goal. Whereas other people, you know, it, 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 that don't have that tool set, it's either, well, we're not going to do it or let's just do it and then we'll ask for forgiveness later. Neither of those approaches, you know, are optimal. So that, that's kind of why I think, you know, from, from a, an industry perspective, you're getting a law degree. Um, it is very different practice of law than, than the study of law. But I think now the cannabis industry does create a lot of opportunities for, for law students and law graduates uh, to participate in an emerging industry. And if this is really, there's no analog for what we're doing in any part of our industrial history, right? There was prohibition when it came to alcohol, but it was short-lived, wasn't really here. Um, here you're taking a, a product that's been part of the fabric of, of society for, for many years, just underground. There's already demand there and you are making it available. So it's a political experiment, a social experiment, a market experiment, and it's super exciting to be a part of. Um, so that's, uh, I'll open up the floor. That's really my story, and um, you know, happy to answer any questions. I don't know if you can answer this. Sorry? I say I don't know if you can answer this. It's about medical marijuana. Yeah. My daughter has MS, and she... Um, was using Nabilone until Tiva just cut, cut off the supply to Nova Scotia for a few months, and she has a lot of pain, so. And then it happened within another month for, I mean, it was crazy, and I don't know what Health Canada is doing about that, but anyway, she started trying marijuana, and now she's pretty much, you know, it, it, it's, she's reached a standard that that pretty much manages her pain. Um, my son has a dog <laughs> with uh, um, movement issues, really old dog, and he's discovered the same uh, percentage of 
is CBD that's in my daughter's medical marijuana. But the difference is in price. It's about a quarter of the price of the medical marijuana. So I don't know if you can answer that, but can you tell me what we get from medical marijuana and if it is at all wise to move to the cheaper? Yeah, so I would say whatever your, your son's dog's taking, that's an illegal product. It's those, an illegal product? Those are not legally permitted? No, no, he gets it from... Uh, from a licensed producer? Yes. Okay, so, so basically they're ordering can, cannabis oil from a licensed producer that's made for humans but giving it to the dog, and one producer is more than the other? One producer is like Yeah, what's the quarter of the price? That part I'm not understanding. Well, he gets, I don't know how much it is, but it's $20 and it's in the same amount that my daughter gets for Yeah, it might be the same amount in Miller. About three weeks. So generally speaking, like, you know, we call it active pharmaceutical ingredient, like API, but generally speaking, it's priced on a per milligram basis. So that price differentia differential is being driven by how much how many milligrams of CBD are in the thing? Because you know, 2,500 milligrams are gonna be more ex twice as expensive as 1,250, but they can fit into the same bottle with the same amount of liquid because all cannabis oil is, is or CBD oil, is distillate, so it's the molecular form of CBD after you, you extract the plant, mixed with like uh, MCT oil, a medium chain triglyceride of some sort, like coconut oil and then you consume it. So the level of dilution is up to the manufacturer. So price is, it will be on the label. So what you have to look at is percentage. So you'll see a percentage, for example, that says 25 milligrams per milliliter. Okay. So that, that's where the price differentiation is, is being driven by. Now in terms of like medical access, so I am a huge uh, advocate and supporter of medical access and I actually think one of the challenges that we have ahead of us as Canadians is ensuring that we preserve the medical access system even in light of the recreational because you know I don't if I'm being a cynic I don't think that's what the federal government is hoping. What um, they're planning you're saying? I don't think that's what their hope is I think the hope is to have one system right one system where there's no stigma attached, and whether you are uh, a patient or a recreational consumer, you go to the retail outlet and you buy your product and you go home and you consume it. The, the problem with that thesis is that you, know, you don't have a lot of protections with your employer, you know, with your insurer, et cetera, for being a recreational consumer of anything. So if I'm a patient and cannabis helps me, I want to access it as a patient because then my employer has a duty to accommodate. You know, my insurer has eventually, hopefully, an obligation to reimburse me. I'm able to write off the, the taxes on my... F yeah, no, it doesn't now because there's no DIN number, right? So there's been court cases as to why... Uh, you know, medical cannabis is not tax exempt, but the medical cannabis system where you register directly with a licensed producer will always be cheaper than the recreational cannabis system because there's no middleman, right? There's no, there's no middleman, okay. right? So the way that the supply chain works for, for cannabis is from a medical perspective, you can get a, a prescription for medical cannabis. You can go to my collab website, register, the supply is different than regulatory system, right? Supply is not a regulatory issue. Supply is an industry issue. But, but that's like Tiva letting go of the Navalon, which... But that's, again, like if Tiva let that go, there's a business reason behind it, and, you know, they obviously preference well, the business like reason. Maybe it had to do with the opioid, opioid crisis. Yeah, that's People possible. People were going to Navalon, but it was, you know, they were making $1,500 a month just from my daughter's perspective. So I, I don't know how many people in Canada are using, we're using, are using now, um, but they're making a lot of money. Yeah, look, I can't speak to what Tiva or the pharmaceutical industry is doing. I can only speak to cannabis. That was a, that was a critical, um, that was the critical moment when we decided to start. And I think that's, res that's, 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 Really, like you hear that story over and over and over again. I think for me as, you know, a medical advocate, 
Um, you know, I helped start Canadians for Fair Access to Medical Marijuana. I was a, a co-founder of Hope for Health, which is a charity just to allow medical patients who can't afford access to get access to the medical system. Um, you know, I think from that perspective, I think it's important to maintain the medical system. It's important to educate patients. And one of the things that I find most exciting is we're really now going to find out what cannabis can do as a health product right? It's all anecdotal, like, you know, people who you hear lots of stories about it, help my child or help my mother, or help me, etc. But from a, a, that it doesn't have the same buy-in from the medical community, because, you know, there's no peer-reviewed studies, and they don't teach it in medical school. But that's because it has been a narcotic, a, a controlled substance to date. And so you can't get funding, research funding, there's no commerce driving it. Right? So I'm going to do lots of studies, you know, pharmacokinetic studies, clinical trials, all sorts of studies to find out what my products actually do to the human being consuming them. I'm doing it from, from a profit motive perspective, right? Because I think if I do this work and I put the best product on the market, you'll want to buy it. But that doesn't change the value of the work being done from an advancement of science perspective. Whether the motive is completely altruistic, whether there's a profit motive behind it, you know, the research is still being done. So the next five years, like what are you gonna see the most advancement? It's gonna be the R&D and the science and figuring out what this plant actually does. And I think with that, hopefully will also come recognition from whether it's regulatory authorities or private insurers that, hey, you know what, this is a better lower cost method of treatment, so let's cover it, right? Because that is, for example, when the, 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 the young man who started Canadians for Fair Access to Medical Marijuana, a very inspirational kid, his name's Jonathan Zayed, and he came from a very well-to-do family, had these, like, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's just constant migraines, constant migraines. His family flew him all over the world for treatment. Nothing worked started consuming cannabis and he had relief. It, he was able to manage the symptoms. So he started this organization, started being a real advocate for medical cannabis. He was able to convince the University of, of Waterloo, convince their insurer that hey, rather than pay for opioids, rather than pay for expensive pharmaceuticals, you should pay for my cannabis because it actually works. It's a lower cost alternative. And so I think since 2016, don't, don't hold me to that. The University of Waterloo, their student insurance plan covers medical cannabis for all their students. So it's only when we advance science, you know, when, when doctors going through medical school understand dosages better and what this plant actually does, that I think we will progress and eventually there will be a DIN or an, NPA, an, an NPN number issued for a cannabis product that will result in third party coverage. For third-party coverage? Yes. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll let's talk after, okay. you know, uh, offline. Thanks. Uh, there's supposed to be a, a growing facility um, in Stellarton or Westville or somewhere down there in an old Claritone electronics plant that has been refurbished. Do you know if that's... Where no, I have no, no idea. When I was a lawyer, it was my business to really know where every project was, where, who, was, who were the protagonists there, and to get to know, now that I'm at Oxley, like I'm laser focused on my business, and so what happens around, I have I'm much less of an idea. And you go, your projects are where in Nova Scotia? So we, we took, again, early, early bets in Ad Atlantic Canada. So we have a big, um, DoseCam, which is our science facility, our product manufacturing facility, that is in Charlottetown, uh, PEI. Um, I, we have a pro project that we jointly own with um, a group of, of uh, Newfoundland families called Atlantic Cultivation, and that is in uh, St. John's, and we have uh, five retail licenses in uh, Newfoundland. And then we own uh, Robinson's, Cannabis, which is an indoor facility in uh, Kentville, uh, Nova Scotia. And then we have an outdoor, a large outdoor project uh, on 156 acres that is uh, just outside of Wolfville in uh, Grand Prix. 
and then we have a small micro grow in uh, Sackville. So we, we have a project never in Atlantic province, but in terms of the one you're mentioning, I, I, I'm not familiar with it. So in terms of licensing, um, I'm not doing licensing and, and regularization of these companies from a meat counter perspective, or are they actually getting samples from them and running them through gas chromatographs and determining if they have what they should have or shouldn't have, or how are they? Yeah, so the government doesn't get very involved in your business plan, right? So. Uh, from a licensing perspective, the way it'll work, and there's been, that too has changed dramatically over, over the course from inception to now. The government will, you know, you fill out an application. It's a very involved application that you fill out. So the days, like I remember the first application we sent in was maybe this thick, and then by the end, they were like volumes. Um, and then the idea is that you f you're responsible for following the re ensuring compliance. The government's not going to sit there every step of the way and hold your hand. You have to convince the government that you're compliant, and the inspectors will show up and say, you know, how do you comply with this section? And you better have an answer, or else they're going to say, well, we'll see you when you have an answer. And now what the government has done, because the strategy when I started advising in this space was, if you wanted to get a license, right, it, these things are, there's a lot of capital investment required. If you wanted to get a license, go work through the regulatory process, get the license or get the, what they would call a confirmation of readiness saying, whenever you're ready for us to come and inspect, let us know and we'll come and then start building. The idea being that the value of your company was higher once you had that confirmation of readiness than before. Because before you're just a guy with a PowerPoint saying, I have a dream. But once you actually have the government saying, yeah, everything you've told us makes sense, now let us know when you want to come to inspect, you can actually put a valuation on that and raise some capital. Problem was, and I think uh, the government's statistic was something really absurd, like 90%. 90% of the people that got there then turned out they were never able to build the facility. They couldn't raise the capital. So the government says, well, wait a minute. I've just spent a ton of resources and time reviewing this application, going back and forth with you, figuring out exactly like what your floor plan means and how you comply, and now you've got nothing? So they put a new, a new requirement in that says, before, they, you know, before you can ask them to come and inspect, you need a fully built facility. So the level of risk that they've put on the producer has even gone up another level, because now you have to put together the application and then you have to put your money in and build before they're going to come and take a look at it. And then once they come and take a look at it, you know, you've got to comply. And of course, what's developed around that system is, um, you know, service providers, right? People who are security experts, who are experts in record keeping and tracking, uh, legal advisors, etc. Like you need a team around you to have a successful application. They've created a second system to encourage kind of more, say, grassroots participation, right? So if you want to have a nice family business, you know, hey, maybe you've cultivated cannabis in your backyard your entire life, and you said this would be my dream to be able to do this, but I'm just looking, like, I, I don't need a massive business. I just want to have a nice business where I support myself and my family, and we do really well, but it's manageable. So they have something called a micro licensing section where there's a lot like the rigor that they apply the regulations is is it's not looser it's just you're never going to be interacting with a client like the idea of a micro license is it's only 2,000 square feet of canopy so that's all plants basic you know your mom's your veg and your your flowering plants so it's a much smaller facility but still enough where you can make a, a really good income but th those micro cultivators can only sell then to a company like Oxley, which takes on the additional regulatory burden of like if there's anything wrong with that cannabis when it goes out to the public, you know, the government's going to come and knock on Oxley's door, not the micro cultivator's door. Camille, did you come? Oh, it was a question about research. You talked about um, the amount of research that's going to be um, required. It's already happening. But I just was interested in getting your view on the extent to which you, your industry, would see themselves, or maybe you're doing it already, partnering with the academy, or is it more going to be in-house research? What's, what's 
No, there, there is, there's actually, so <clears throat> there is a ton of partnership with, with academia um, in and, and, you know, keep in mind, like <laughs> some of that is both cost driven, some of it's regulatory driven. So at the beginning of the industry, the only places you could find that had a licensed dealer license that let you perform activities with cannabis were places like Jonathan Page's lab at the University of Saskatchewan and then at UBC. So you had to partner with someone. If you, if you wanted to do research, you had to find one of these licenses. So there was you know, some regulatory issues that, that took companies into the academic sort of with academic partners. And then there was also prestige, right? You've got, you know, you've got researchers either at a specific institution that uh, have a name or the institution itself. So you wanted a way to say, look, we're partnering with the university of so-and-so to research A, B, and C. Um, I think that's going to continue. And in, in fact, I think you'll see an uptick in that activity. Of course, when you partner with a university, there are a lot of additional issues around speed, right? Like we're not moving at academic pace. Like, you know, like we have to move very, very fast. So speed, IP ownership starts to become an issue. Like what happens if this IP gets commercialized? Who owns it? You know, what does it mean? And in cannabis, IP issues are actually quite complicated because early movers like GW Pharmaceuticals really papered um, the sort of the IP universe really well. So doing freedom to operate analysis within patents to see where you can actually take product development gets quite complicated. Um, but it's really kind of speed and then IP ownerships where like it, the approach we've taken at a CRO, we will still partner with, uh, with universities. In fact, KGK itself is an offshoot of, uh, of Western Ontario. Uh, so we'll still partner with, uh, with universities. In a lot of the emerging jurisdictions, that is an approach to get you connected also into the sort of um, the community that, that's looking at cannabis and taking the same sort of approach. So I think there's lots of great opportunity for uh, academic institutions to partner with cannabis companies. I think that and the IP issues are easier to get around. It's usually the speed that is harder harder issue to address. There's a question here and one up here. You, Let's start at the back. You've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to know that it's really refreshing and appreciated to hear a professional, successful person actually come up and describe themselves as a cannabis enthusiast. You'd be surprised how, I mean, I'm sure you would be surprised that that doesn't happen very often. Um, and then my question is, as a first-year law student who is interested in working at the intersection of law and cannabis, um, it's still obviously a very new industry and there's no sort of clear path of how to get there. So do you have any um, advice or, or ways that a person could position themselves or where they should be in order to enter this industry? Yeah, I, look, I think it's really along the same lessons I learned in, in my own way. Like even though, you know, you're a first year law student, let's not, you, you know, getting to where you are is very difficult. Um, and so, you have a lot to offer. Uh, so I would say if you're interested, you know, just get involved. Like it, it, Nova Scotia has got a really good community around cannabis. So go to the events, put yourself out there, introduce yourself. Um, and then there's lots of companies that would love to, you know, have you as an intern or uh, as a summer student, et cetera, where you're going to get some, ex like, you know, they're not going to lean on you as a, a lawyer, or at least if, if that's what they want to do, maybe kind of give it a second thought because, you know, it's probably they're trying to cut corners in other areas as well. But, you know, it, just to have you involved and to give you exposure. I remember we had, a, you know, and we had a, another, another uh, very superstar student at, at Bennett Jones named uh, Matt Sanders. And we, we asked him to intern for us for the summer because he worked with our group and he did. And he was tremendous value. He did nothing legal. You know, what he did was shepherd our collab Saskatchewan license, uh, retail license through, like we got awarded a license in a lottery, but then there's a ton of administrative stuff you have to do, gathering information, providing business plans, providing, 
you know, uh, timeline analysis for when you're going to build. So we let him run that whole project. And I remember when he left, I was like, oh my God, who's going to run? Like Matt's been doing such an amazing job. So don't sell yourself short. Like you have uh, a toolkit and you have skills that most people who are in the industry don't. And it's just put yourself out there, get involved and uh, ask for things. Right? You don't ask, you're not going to get, and you'll be surprised how many times you ask for something that you thought, I don't know if they're going to go for it, where you know, uh, people are very accommodating. Right? Every, everyone wants, like, the biggest, the biggest um, one of the biggest challenges we have at our business, getting enough top, top talent. Right? We just can't get it fast enough. Just really smart uh, people who are enthusiastic and passionate about what they're doing. Uh, we'll just take one more question sure. and then wrap everything up. Let's just sort of comment on the cost. I'm sitting here listening to all the regulation and the person has to come in and you scissors and do more cutting. You know, and I'm thinking about the you know, cost of production, you know, and, and break even points. Um, when it was first legal and the uh, companies, a lot of investors ran to invest. Sure. And then it did. And then most of the time when you see the uh, financial results, stock prices for the marijuana companies, their barrels are always pointing down. And then when you read the press, you find that we didn't have enough supply at first, so no one's going to make any money. Now you find out we might have too much supply. And you know, there's export markets. And then there's more regulation and more regulation, more people to come in to cut the scissors. And I'm not a, a lawyer, so a lot of the regulation is a little hard to get an accountant. So I'm just sitting here wiggling in my seat and thinking of unit costs and your competition. The black market, like, and how do you really deal with that? Like, when you think yeah. about your book that put a consumer, like, I want to use marijuana, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, gee, you know, am I going to pay those high prices of all your scissor cutters sure, and of course. all these, you know, team of lawyers that you have, you know, working there? All those costs going into the unit cost of a puff or, or a gummy or, or whatever. And then thinking about the black market, you can buy, as a consumer, if I could buy seeds, you know, quality seeds, no problem. Go your own. Then you're going to have competition from pop up backyard greenhouses. Everyone's going to grow their own. The way that you can even make the oil, um, there's no real proprietary technology on that, but there'll be people that can build the better buggy or whatever. They're going to come out, and it, it'll end up being more of a do it yourself kind of industry. How do you see those sorts of, uh, of threats, or where is the opportunity? Yeah, so look, I think first and foremost, if you want to grow your own cannabis and you want to extract your own oil, make your own goods, like I don't see that as a threat at, at all. You know, I encourage you to do it. You know, I, I, you know, I grow cannabis myself too. It's a fantastic little hobby. You know, <laughs> got my mom growing it too. I'm saying, you know, mom, you got an amazing green thumb. What can you do with this plant? Um, you're allowed to grow your own tomatoes, your own cucumbers. The fact of the matter is most consumers don't because it's available at a good price with standardized quality whenever you want it. Um, so I'm going to, like there's a lot in your question, so let me try and unpack it a little bit. In terms of the commodification of price, so the black market producer doesn't have to worry about SOPs for cleaning scissors and providing records, so there's no compliance cost to that. Um, at the bottom end of the market, you know, by all means, I, I really don't care. I don't play at that part of the market. Right? I play in the derivative products part of the market where it is very difficult for the black market guy to make standardized capsules or to make you know, edibles at scale, et cetera. Yeah, but does your consumer really... Well, let me, let me, let me finish, right? So you're a consumer. Okay, you buy, you drink, do you drink alcohol? No alcohol? Okay, let me try something else. Uh, how about, how about you ever taken a prescription medication? Okay. So what if you could, I was on the street corner, let's just take anything, ibuprofen. If I was on the street corner and I gave you a bottle and I said it's ibuprofen and it's half the price, you going to buy that and take it? Or are you going to go to the pharmacy and buy the ibuprofen that's got, you know, exactly how many milligrams of ibuprofen under each tablet? produced under GMP conditions, got all the information. If there's a problem, you can go to your pharmacist and say, hey, I bought this here and it's not working or there's a defect. Because what I found, you know, and as I said, I was a cannabis enthusiast. So in terms of the black market, been around, around it uh, until there was a regulated market. Didn't participate in it, you know, had other ambitions in life. But 
what, what was the turning point for me in terms of going from consuming an unregulated product to a regulated product? Where I found that my mind shifted was after I consumed the regulated product, I got really, really used to and expect, in fact, expected the information that came with it, right? The certificate of analysis that underlies that says this is this many milligrams of THC. This is this is when it was packed, right? Whereas you don't get that in the black market. Well, you so could, you can always send it over acid. You can, but that's yeah, so. Have you ever sent out? Uh, you ever sent out a batch of cannabis for for testing? Okay, well, it doesn't require one gram or half a gram. It requires 100 grams plus, and it costs $2,000 to run the tests on it. So if you want to talk unit cost, there's no way your unit cost a black market that's tested and that has information can march my, match my unit cost. Back to you scare the consumer in the fear that the quality is... No, I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not here to scare anyone because I'm not, I'm, not I'm not a prohibitionist. So for me, it's just a tip. It's just like I asked you a question to begin with. I didn't try and scare you about the black market ibuprofen. I just asked you a simple question. Given, are you willing to pay for information? And if as a consumer, you are, you will always preference a regulated product to an unregulated product because the unregulated product does not come with information. There, there, is, some, there is some truth to that, no question. But with, in terms of unit cost, like even the cost of you assaying your certificate of analysis, like your unit costs, you know, on that market are huge. Like nobody's making any money right now from investing in marijuana. Yeah, look, I'm not here to talk about the investor perspective. I would just say this. No, no, but is the government is moving it to the point where it becoming more regulated, more regulated, like look. And we might bring in like the marijuana marketing board. Yeah, there is. There is. It's yeah, called yeah. cannabis health products and like, they're so regulated. When you, you sort of look at, you know, five, ten years down the road, like you're kind of think, you know, where are we really going to be here? We're going to have, you know, a few people and it's going to be so regulated. Like remember we had the I hate to interrupt, but we've got a time to oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's all right, I can continue the conversation yeah. offline. Yeah, so yeah, no Thank you. Thanks for having me.